Welcome to another deep dive edition with Zach Abraham, Chief Investment Officer at Bulwark Capital Management, who we invite on the show every couple of weeks to walk us through some of the wonky stuff that we don't understand on our own when it, uh, when it relates to the financial markets and the stock market and all of that hullabaloo. Which is pretty much so, everything, because I don't which understand is pretty anything much in finance. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> I just don't understand anything. Now, Zach, before we uh, went live or went on air, rather, you were saying that you have some frustration Mm -hmm. with the current situation. Care to elaborate? Yeah. Well, let me look. I I, (laughs) there's no one of the things that annoys me. You know, you guys, we talk about it, but we do our own show and we, we have a podcast as well. And one of the things that drives me nuts in this industry is that everybody that has a show or a podcast, um, you would think that they have never had a year where they didn't beat the market, right? You would think that they're just like these super geniuses of fine. And it's always hilarious because the better they sound, we look at their underlying portfolio and you're like, good golly, this is bad, (laughs) Mm -hmm. right? So I will just tell you that I am very frustrated because we are underperforming the market significantly this year. We're like up a percent or two or whatever stock market's up 18. So that's probably not the best advertisement to <laughs> call us. Now, flip side is last year we outperformed by even more. So we're, we're doing fine relative to the market. But what's fascinating about this year, and again, me not offering excuses, right? What's fascinating about this year is we went into this year, and one of the reasons we're just sitting around even on the year is because we've been very cautiously positioned. And the reason we've been cautiously positioned is because we saw the economy slowing down. We saw rates going higher. We saw credit contracting, especially after the Silicon Valley Bank you know, scenario. And um, we very much thought that revenues and earnings would drop this year. And uh, with higher interest rates, that stocks are not worth as much, right? They, they go down, not like a crash or anything, just saying it's, you know, it's, If earnings and revenues are falling and interest rates are going up, stocks don't go up. Well, until this year. So the the frustrating thing is we, we, we were sitting around trying to figure out when was the last time we got the fundamental picture right, and yet... It, things still went the other way and mm-hmm. it's never happened to us. I'm sure there's other times where it's happened. So we start digging in it historically and going, okay, when was the last time the market was up double digits over a six month period of time in which we saw margins, revenues, and earnings profit falling while interest rates moved higher. And the answer we found out is it's never happened. Not once in history, right? Oh my gosh. Which makes which makes sense. I don't, I don't want to go too deep, deep in the weeds in financial analysis, but you know, just think about it. If a company's revenues, their profits, and their margins are falling, okay, usually you wouldn't think that that you got to go buy, right? You got to buy that. <laughs> We're looking for losers here, people. That's how you make your money, right? And then also when interest rates go up, that pushes stock valuations down as well. And for the simple reason of, look, for the last 15 years, if you want to buy a bond, you were making one and a half to 2%. Now you can make five, five and a half, right? So taking risk in a stock where it can lose 100% of your money, it's not as attractive when we can make five or 6% taking no risk, right? So you add all these things to go up or you add all these things together and you're like, what, why why are stocks going up? And uh, I get asked that by clients and I, my answer is, you know, I don't know. Why do people think men can have babies? <laughs> I, I, you, know, I, 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 you know, I know we're off. I know we're off the path. I know it's bizarre. I know it doesn't make sense, but I don't have an answer for why. So I, I think we have a couple answers, but I, I, I think that one of the dangers of this cycle that we're currently in, especially right now, is investors, and rightfully so, one of the things that really influences our read of the economy, right, is the stock market. So many of us, you know, there's the old adage, the stock market isn't the economy, but, you know, we all do that, right? We're like, well, the economy, shoot, look at the NASDAQ, you know, look, S&P's up 19%, things really got to be heating up. No, no, it's actually going the other direction. And I I think there's a lot of reasons for that, but the scary part in, in the article that you referenced is that to the greatest percentage in history, we've never seen anything like it. The top eight stocks in the market make up about 40% of the value, okay? So 
you got 500 stocks in the S&P 500, 40% of the entire value of the S&P 500 is eight stocks. Okay. And I, you know, I read a headline about that recently that was on CNN Business, which I always refer to right before we're about to talk to you, <laughs> so I can feel a little bit smarter. Um, <laughs> and it said it's all tech stuff, right? It's like Apple, it's Microsoft, it's Amazon, it's Meta. So, yep. but the headline I remember it said that the Biden administration is worried about that. So, explain why that's happening and what's going on. Why they would be worried? Because it's extraordinarily unhealthy. So what you see, okay, so it, it typically in bear markets, which statistically, if you look at it or on a technical analysis basis, if you look at charts and look at the market, technically there would be a lot of arguments that would say we're no longer in a bear market. We believe that we are, meaning I believe that the recession just hasn't hit yet and that the worst is to come. And we're really seeing the data coming in every single day that shows deterioration. Consumer spending is slowing down. Um, we just had uh, a couple different airlines come out. I think Alaska just came out and said uh, they had significantly slower growth this quarter and they guided it down even further for next quarter. They're seeing you know, travel demand start. So everywhere we look, you're seeing the weakness and the stock market's literally going the opposite way. But the reason that's dangerous is because you start building up so much value in just a few stocks. And if one of those is to break or several <clears throat> of those are to break, there's nothing underneath supporting it because everybody is on the same side of the ship, right? Everybody and their mother owns these eight stocks. Okay, so what triggers that? Who knows, right? It could be one of those companies coming in with a big earnings beat or loss, the other problem it, it creates is what we call price discovery, meaning we all say we believe in free markets, but I don't think a lot of us really understand why, right? The beautiful, there, there's a really cool thing that's always fascin fascinated me about statistical analysis. So if, if, you know, like at the fair, well, you, they'll have like a giant jar of jelly beans, right? And they're like, how, we got to have you, you got to take a guess how many are in there, right? And whoever gets it right. Well, we know through statistical analysis, if we get a, if we ask enough people to give us a guess, right? We, and I don't know what the number is, but let's say there's 10,000 jelly beans in the jar. If we ask enough people and we average all of their answers together, we will get the right answer. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it happens every single, it's fascinating to me, like how statistics work. And it, I, I've, I've done it. I've experimented with it. It works, right? Markets work the same way, meaning when you have free markets, you have all of these opinions coming in, the pricing accuracy of the assets in that market increases. It gets better and better and better, right? And so we call that price discovery, meaning if we really want to know, and, and think about it, it's as simple as if we want to know what something's worth, get together a huge group of people and stage an auction, right? And that's kind of the way markets work, right? Same, same basic principle. Well, when you have so much value concentrated in such a small area, it, 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 it feeds on itself. Meaning if you go out and buy an S and P 500 ETF, okay. So it just tracks the S and P 500. You buy the stock market, 40 cents out of every dollar is going directly to those companies. Okay. The other 60 cents is getting spread out between the other 492. All right. So now enough people do that, that 40% climbs to 45, right? And it keeps feeding on itself because they keep getting bigger and they keep having more weight. And so the market gets continually even more and more lopsided and more vulnerable because when, not if, when those stocks crack, due to falling earnings, or they just get way too insanely expensive, which I think you can make an argument it's getting there right now. There's nothing there to support it. And those same people that bought the S and P without thinking about it, they hit sell. Okay. Now they hit sell and 45% of that sale pressure is going against those eight stocks. So it really increases the volatility of the market. And it increases the vulnerability of the market. If those eight stocks drop, let's say all the other companies are doing really good and those eight stocks take a beating, stock market's going down huge, right? Because the other side of it doesn't have enough weight to hold up against that. Yeah. And so it's just this problem. And the better those stocks do, because all that money's going into it, the more money chases them. And so you just reach a breaking point and who knows where it is. We think you're getting close, but what could be wrong, been wrong before. 
but you reach a breaking point where everybody hits buy all the time. Eventually, they'll all be hitting sell at the same time. Yikes. And then you got a market that goes no bid. Right? So is it better – like if you're just – if you're advising an individual, <clears throat> do you tell them, yeah, go into those seven or eight stocks or do you say get out while you can or do both? Or do you like, I mean, ha like have those – like get those stocks and then diversify? You know what I mean? It, like – yeah, so that's kind of what we do, right? So, but we've got we've got hedges in place constantly. So mm -hmm. if that starts to drop, it it'll counterbalance or it'll just kick them out automatically. But really, in a market like this, you have to own some. You have to own some of them, right? right. Um, because you know you're not going to be able to keep up with market performance if you don't, right? Regardless of the underlying performance. What what I honestly would tell people at home doing it on their own is, you know. If you own high quality businesses, like even an Apple or, you know, an Apple is <laughs> Apple's another, I mean, it, Apple's a beast of a company, but the value, their valuation has exploded this year while they've had two consecutive quarters of declining revenues and declining earnings and declining margins, right? So it, it's just bizarro world, right? Um, if you want to buy and hold for a long time, you know, I, I would, I don't think Apple's going to ruin you. I, like I said, I think they're a great company, but what I would say is, um, I think this is the tough, well, I, it, it, I don't think this is the toughest market I've ever navigated and I've been running a portfolio live, right? We don't buy mutual funds and ETFs for our clients. We actually manage the underlying portfolios. I've been doing that since 07. So we've gone through some rough spots. You, you know? were seven. I'm just like trying to picture that, that you yeah. were doing this when you were seven. Oh, no, no, and so he said since I said I started 07. in 07. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> since 07. <laughs> That yeah, is the cutest visual well, that's, ever. Yeah, that's how I became a billionaire at age 19, right? No. I was like, <laughs> look at my you with your big brain. Yeah. Zach at age seven. Go on. Now, I, now I was discussing look at stock. The okay. Yeah. Well, oh still, God. that is adorable. Yeah, Seriously, yeah, though, that but... is the cutest visual, though, is to see Zach at age seven, like, just crunching the numbers. Yeah, mom, <laughs> no I don't idea. have time for dinner. I've got to hedge these positions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not playing little league. I'm doing yeah. numbers. Yeah. No. I, so, so <laughs> what advice would I give to the individual doing it on your own? Well, obviously I'm biased, but I mean, I just, I, I would just say this is not a market to learn in. Um, it, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's just not your grandparents stock market. And mm -mm. Um, I would say to be highly cautious. The other thing, here's the other thing that makes this so bizarre to me is you're running up, you're running up these stocks that, to prices that make, I mean, no sense at all. And you're doing it when you can make five times the amount of interest that or taking zero risk that you've been able to make at any time over the last 15 or 16 years. So you're just looking at people going, what on earth are you doing? Mm. And, um, you know, but it's hard guys. I, you know, I'm not the first person to say this, but my grandfather, you say it to me all the time, just because something is inevitable doesn't mean it's imminent. Timing of these things is really hard. I just know that when we look at history, um, bubbles are not a new thing. They happen. Things get irrationally expensive. People chase it. This goes back this goes back to as long as Isaac Newton, Isaac Newton, the great Isaac Newton lost all of his money betting on the South sea company, right. In a, in a bubble. And he knew it was a bubble and then it kept going up and he put all of his money into it right at the top and then got killed. Right. The guy that like basically brought modern astronomy to us. Right. Yeah. So not a dumb guy. Um, so this is a tale as old as time. And it's one of the toughest parts of investing. Um, a couple of my mentors that have had unbelievable success being money managers, They've got it. They both say the same thing. If you're doing the right thing at the top of these cycles, you're probably going to lose clients because they're going to sit there and go, why are we not going up? And you're like, because this doesn't make any sense and it's going to crash. But every day that it keeps going up, everybody believes it more and everybody sticks with it. And so, you know, we just sit there and go, look, I think there's a lot of companies out there paying really good dividends that aren't expensive, that are actually stupid cheap. I think we can make 5% taking zero risk. And we just as risk managers with our clients' money just go, you know what? Now's not a time. Those things might keep going up. That's fine. You know, if my clients make 5 or 6% and the market's up 15, I'm not going to be happy about it. But making 5 to 6% doesn't ruin somebody's retirement. Losing 50% mm -hmm. does. Right. right. So, that is the perfect way to say amen it. to and, that. Uh -huh. And that is why it's so important for people to know where they can get more advice from you. So where, mm -hmm. where is that? 
Yeah, so you, you can go to the podcast. We do a show every week, Know Your Risk Radio. It goes, it's on several different radio stations uh, on, the, on the West Coast. Um, and then, but it is podcasted out, right? So they can find us on iTunes. You just go into iTunes or, or anywhere else that has pod, not iTunes, I, I guess, with the Apple podcast, any podcast app, Spotify, whatever it is, just go and type in Know Your Risk Radio. We'll pop up and um, hopefully we can shed some light. And then we, we don't just talk about what we think. We also interview other money managers, get other perspectives and hopefully try to break things down. You know, you guys are a perfect example. You're like, oh, we don't know anything. You do. You just don't know the vernacular, right? You know what I mean? You, you get the concepts. It's just you don't yeah. know the code words. Yeah. So we, we try to make it, you know, digestible for the people that don't do this for a living. Yeah. Well, That's Zach great. Abraham, Chief Investment Officer, at Bulwark Capital Management. Check him out. Knowyourriskradio.com. Thank you again Thank you, Zach. for Thank another for great learning me, experience. You bet. Thank you. <laughs> Investment advisory services offered through Trek Financial LLC, an SEC registered investment advisor. Information presented is for educational purposes only. It should not be considered specific investment advice, does not take into consideration your specific situation, and does not intend to make an offer or solicitation for the sale or purchase of any securities or investment strategies. Investments involve risk and are not guaranteed, and past performance is no guarantee of future results. For specific tax advice on strategy, consult with a qualified tax professional before implementing any strategy discussed herein.